and thank you for this uh, this opportunity to uh, to host this panel. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, to have the opportunity to speak about such important topics with such well informed and well, frankly, very interesting people as we're uh, we're joined by today. Um, so, of course, Dataiku, we are a platform for uh, doing AI in the enterprise. Um, some of you may be uh, familiar with us. We are we're on a very interesting trajectory, which is all very exciting. Um, and I'm very happy to be the uh, the chief customer officer, uh, which gives me the opportunity to work with a lot of uh, very ambitious companies doing incredible things with uh, with AI every day. Um, but uh, I'm going to be actually doing very little speaking today, which makes me very happy uh, because, of course, today the focus is, in, uh, is going to be on our panelists. Um, and so I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves briefly, um, perhaps starting with uh, Tudor Morrison. Uh, would you uh, would you like to introduce our, uh, yourself? Yes, sure. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tudor Morrison. Chief Data um, and um, an Advanced Analytics Officer in Financial Crimes, Bank of Montreal. I've been with this business, Data and Advanced Analytics, for many, many years. Part of my, main, my mandate is to promote and to advance uh, uh, the analytics and machine learning in, in my field. Back to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tudor. Uh, next, uh, Adele Pugliese uh, from Bintel Green Oak. Uh, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? Hi, thank you. Excited to be here and excited to be participating with such an esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Adele Pugliese. I'm the Vice President of Data Enablement and Analytics at a firm called Bental Green Oak. We are a division of Sun Life Financial. Um, I lead a team there within the company and our role is to um, develop the data capability and enable it to drive analytics and insightful value to the business. So we're all about ensuring that uh, we drive the value to the business. Thank you. Wonderful. It's great to have you with us as well. Um, and next up, uh, our third panelist is Vala Gopalakrishnan from Pelmerex or the Weather Network. Uh, Vala, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Kurt. Uh, thank you for having me and great to be with this great panelist and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bala. I am uh, the Chief Data Officer at Palmorex, which is the holding company for the Weather Network in Canada, El Tiempo in Spain, Weather Source in US. We are primarily a B2C company. We have 50 million users using weather services on our apps, on our digital properties. Uh, but we also apply um, AI to B2B industries through the data collected through the app and also the weather data. And we put in a lot of applications, whether it's uh, monetizing on our properties, as well as um, insights to industries and even better, better weather forecasting. So great to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, it's great to have all of you on the, the panel today. Um, let's go ahead and kick things off. And always with these panels, I like to start with a, a little bit of a state of the art, check in, where are we at today? Um, so I'd like to ask you, uh, how mature are the AI solutions that we're seeing currently? Um, what are some of the more realistic use cases that uh, that an enterprise may be able to use? And what might be some of those, those challenges to actually getting those models out into production? Um, for this first question, I'd like to, to toss it over to Bala first uh, to, uh, uh, to get us kicked off. Uh, thank you, Kurt. It's a great question. To the first part, you know how mature um, AI solutions are. I think we all know that it's a probably a broad spectrum. There are some industries where AI is really deep, uh, from voice-based digital assistants to self-driving cars, where they're solving big problems um, and deep problems. And so I, I would say that's that end of the spectrum is more like. AI is solving uh, a hard problem, but there are also you know, uh, many industries where AI is still at a starting point, uh, where AI is looking for a problem, um, I would say, um, rather than the other way. Um, and in terms of you know, realistic use cases um, in an enterprise, I think the, the framework in general, I would say is, is the, uh, there are three elements to it. One is, is there an actionable business problem that the business can actually solve with the AI? So are there evidences of that is probably number one. Number two is, um, are there realistic models that exist in a different industry where similar problems have been solved? There are lots of models out there from recommendation models to uh, regression models, and they've been put to many use, but 
the second part of the framework is to figure out is can this be solved within within this enterprise um, and then third is the most important thing is do we have all the available data for uh, this model to be uh, successfully used so i think that is the you know uh, more than you know there are many many problems that ai can solve from custom customer acquisition to fraud detection to you know um, many many areas but those three elements of the framework are probably more important to see in an enterprise or their realistic use cases um, and then that in terms of challenges you raised of you know putting models into production um, i think you know, I, I would again summarize it in, in three bullets. Number one is ML ops is probably more complex than ML as uh, people who have put things into production know because um, in ML, you're just trying to get to a good state, but in ML ops, you're trying to connect all the pipes from upstream collecting the data to providing the results um, real time. So. It involves pipelines, it involves, um, you know, scaling models and all of that. So that is uh, probably number one. Number two, I think is, you know, depending on the velocity of the data and the number of models that uh, one is using, you know, again, compared to uh, the, the lab, when you put in production, the ML ops is much more complex and cost, costly too. So the cost factor really scales at, at that point. Um, so those are, you know, important challenges, you know, when we consider, you know, going to production from just a uh, basic lab-based environment. So if I'm summarizing correctly, you know, it's a matter that it seems like the, you know, the promises there, it's being proven out in many different areas, the challenge is how to scale it, how to, uh, you know, select the appropriate use case in a given industry. And then of course the, uh, you know, the additional uh, challenges of getting it, getting it out of development mode, out of a notebook, and you know, built into core backend processes. Um, Tudor, does does that match with uh, with your experience? Um, is there, uh, you know, would you like to to add on to you know your perspective on the state of things today? Yeah, Bala said it very nicely. You know, so I can I can add a little bit of different flavor from for, from two different angles, but uh, but I'm there with him. So when I look to to maturity, I look from two uh, dimension from state of the art and from the state of the hype. State of the art is uh, we know we uh, comparing with the last year we advanced, we're in a growing, uh, growing uh, phase, but we are not there, we're not super mature. The, the, the biggest thing probably happening last year was the advancement in uh, natural language processing and related, the GPT-3 model, which you know pr pr provokes so many waves and, and uh, change the, 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 the way we understand to process natural language the same way we many years ago, convolutional nat networks helped us to, to understand how to process images. When it comes to state of hype, it's something interesting and I want to point out here. It's a, uh, you know, in the very beginning, uh, AI was uh, something which solved absolutely every problem. It was like the, 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 the solution to everything. Then came, like AI is the final terminator, you know, another type of a hype. I guess we we came to right now to realization that there is a lot of work to do there. It's a, we are more realistic. So I think the the the, the turning point is um, was happening in my opinion this year, like in July 2021, when these three big guys, you know, Joshua, Benjo, Jan, Lecun, and, and Jeffrey Hinton, you know, the three the three biggest probably names in in AI came with a uh, very interesting paper. I guess everybody should read it. It's about deep learning for AI. So part of the part of the, this paper, they uh, attack the problem, uh, whatever they believe are the structural problem with AI. Structural problem if not fixed, will do will, will, will lead to, to a collapse of this of this science. And I see this like a segue to the last uh, uh, part of your question, what are the challenges? Whatever they, they, they identify like challenges is very true. First of all, it's a supervised learning needs a lot of labeling, a lot of label data. So we know who is labeling data, business, and it's very time consuming. So without labeling data, you don't have, you cannot have uh, a supervised system. Uh, if you use reinforcement learning, you need an enormous amount of scenarios to repeat and repeat, repeat which re requires an enormous amount of, 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 of computing power. So this is one big thing, you know, you cannot move if you don't have label data. You have perfect data, but without labels, you cannot move. 
The second thing is, and, uh, and um, is the statistical distribution of data. This is probably a little bit of science here, but everybody should be aware. You, this is how AI works. You train your system based on data, but if the production data, statistically speaking, is different, your models will not work. So what they say, quote unquote, very interesting, as a practical consequence, the performance of today's AI system tend to take a hit when they go to lab from lab to production. So I continue to believe on top of, of, uh, of the operational aspects of the problem and, uh, and the uh, creation of uh, business use cases, the labeling, the label data and uh, the statistical difference are big challenges to, uh, for, uh, to move from lab to production. Yeah, that's extremely interesting, uh, uh, Tudor, and I think uh, I've just noted down the paper to, to make sure I do read it uh, in its original form. I've seen some quotes from, from it, but uh, no, that's, uh, I, I think, a very important observation. Um, Adil, uh, would you like to, uh, to add on to, uh, to this topic of you know, where things are at today? Yeah, and I think I, I will provide a totally different perspective. And what I mean by that, I'm going to go right to the maturity question, um, and it varies between organization and industry. So uh, we are uh, we participate in commercial real estate, the fifth asset class in the investment. And traditionally, um, uh, the commercial real estate space has been very slow to adopt to technology, and obviously uh, slow to adopt to sort of analytics and, and advanced analytics like AI. So for us, it's it's really a journey in terms of um, getting that data literacy. The the um, literacy of how to deploy the and uh, leverage some of the tools that are coming and becoming available to us. The benefit, though, of starting late in the game, so to speak, is that we, we have the opportunity because we have two prevailing big changes happening that are impacting our industry. One is the pandemic uh, that's currently uh, uh, impacting all of us and that has really impacted our and disrupted our industry. The other piece of it which is going to be um, as big if not larger is the whole climate risk or the ESG piece of it because there's going to be an enhancement in terms of information um, management oversight on that. So we've got two sort of tectonic shifts happening that are going to influence but it's going to force us to get into the space and start to adopt and leverage it. And so I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we're doing right now to be able to start that education process is um, come up with uh, proof of concept so that we can test ideas out there in these spaces and kind of demonstrate the value and start to show the organization the journey and the path um, to getting more advanced on the, that AI spectrum and increase our maturity. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Adele. And I, I think that the, you know, the three responses help to capture the, the challenge where you have this massive and rapid increase in technical potential with, you know, uh, Tudor, you mentioned G, uh, GPT-3 um, and the, you know, the, the state of the art is advancing very, very quickly. Um, and at the same time, right, we have, uh, you know, thousands, millions of, uh, uh, of you know, workers, of employees who need to be, who need to be upskilled, who need to be brought into this. And all, of course, within a broader context of, you know, governance at the, you know, the corporate level, but of course at the societal level uh, as well. Um, for our next question, maybe let's focus in on the, you know, the, the aspect of why do we do this and what do we get out of this? Um, and ultimately that comes down to business strategy and how AI is fitting into that business strategy and how it's feeding into those wider business goals. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe to, to frame the question a little bit more specifically, uh, how can you ensure that you really are really successful in deriving real value and measurable ROI from you know uh, from the business when when applying AI to those uh, to those questions, um, Adele, I'd like to throw it back to you for uh, 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 you know to kick us off on this topic. Yeah, that, this is actually one of my favorite questions because I think foundationally it needs to support the business and it has to tie into the strategy. Um, and you know we we just talked about it in terms of uh, the previous question and some of the insights provided by. Um, uh, Bala and Tudor, and that is, there's a lot of requirement, effort, investment, investment, not only in money, but in time, because it takes the maturity and the benefit from the outcomes of, of the uh, AI or any of the analytics requires time. 
And so it has to tie into the strategy of where the business is going. It has to be important to them. It has to drive the value and support the business. So what, what I've done in our organization is exactly that. You know, we work with the business to understand the strate- strategy, where they're going, what are their short-term, long-term goals. And then what I start to do is deconstruct that in a way that overlays that data piece and, and the analytics side of it. And through that journey, that's how we kind of identify the use cases, figure out our data and start to kind of build out natural project plans from there. But that, and the other piece of it that I think is important to um, get to the conversation because it's kind of like, what problem are you trying to solve with AI? And I think that piece often gets missed in the conversation because not all problems need AI to solve it. And so there really needs to be um, time spent on understanding what is it that you're trying to achieve the outcomes, the actual outcomes that are required, and perhaps there's a, a phasing of it. Um, that can get you there in terms of perhaps just basic some type of dashboard of KPIs to then allow you the opportunity to learn and to manage that growth and and, uh, path to get to sort of the AI. Because as you heard, the infrastructure to support it and the rest of it is quite significant. Indeed. Uh, Bala, uh, does this this resonate with what you're experiencing within uh, within Pelmerx? Uh, very much, yeah. I think uh, Adele covered a lot of it. Um, I mean, just to reinforce some of what she said, um, for successful AI projects, I think there's a there's a what and a how. The what is really the needs to be aligned with first of all the strategy of the organization, and then that strategy leading to specific projects that AI is solving with very clear business goals. Um, I think. Um, a lot of projects fail where those descriptions are very big as, as to what the outcome of the project needs to be. And it also needs to be fairly realistic. Like I think just putting a metric together because that's what you want to achieve is also setting up one for uh, failure. And, and as I always say that the last piece is do you have the data and the expertise and, the mo- and there are similar models from which this problem can be solved is um, another thing to be looked at. Beyond that, I think it all becomes a how, um, you know, um, is the data, even though you may have the data, is it accessible uh, or you, is it locked up in silos? It's, are you dependent on partners? So how realistic is that? Do you, have you done a POC and did it show results that, you know, you can go to the next step or, you know, are you trying to do a big waterfall? Do we have all the stakeholder support? Um, are they aligned from the different divisions with the same goals? So all of that is the how, um, which which leads to the success of the project. And I can give a, you know a quickly a very concrete example right, in our space. For example, weather forecast. You know, uh, people always want accurate weather forecast. They want to know what it is going to be next hour, right? And this is a field uh, where you might think AI is highly applicable, but to uh, Adele's point, AI has not been successful. The reasoning for this is even 50 years, I mean, at the end of the day, AI is sort of a, um, a mathematical model, which is linking inputs and outputs. That's what fundamentally is. The weather forecast is already doing that. It's a physics model, which is linking, you know, state of weather to what's going to happen next. And there is already parameters in that, which um, allows you to take whether the weather prediction was correct and, and control your biases. So with this, AI was not heavily successful in this area because the problem was not the model. The problem is there is too much uncertainty in the input data, what we, what we know, and too much dependence on accuracy in the output data. Even if you say it's one degree hotter, you know, people are not going to be happy, right? So that's an area where AI didn't play out well. Where it is playing out well is in climate modeling because in climate modeling, you are looking at decades of data, but what you want to know on the output is more trends. Is it going to be hotter? It's not like it's how much exactly it's going to be hotter. So I think that's a good example of you know where the what and the how come together to determine an AI use case. Yeah, I think that that's a that's an extremely evocative example for us all as well. We we all experience that uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, the frustration with uh, you know perceiving that a 
um, uh, that a weather forecast is wrong. And I think that we're in many cases adapting to this probabilistic way of thinking that you know that you know it's not a deterministic outcome that we're saying it, we're guaranteeing will happen, but rather that there's you know a probability uh, that a certain outcome will uh, will occur. Uh, Tudor, would you like to uh, to provide your uh, uh, your perspective on this? Yes, of course. Thank you. So. Totally support, and I, I guess everybody supports the strategy. So the very first, first thing you have to do, you have to be in sync with business strategy, understand it, you know, work with them, have somebody from, from their team in your team and vice versa to, to put these things on the same table. This is a must. Um, how the value, the way you bring value, in my opinion, is like uh, maybe two or three folds. One is, uh, so I'll start with this one, is the, the long-term value, the innovation part of the story. This is an emerging field. So if you are not part of it, you can be uh, let out and, and, and you, 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 can, you can lose the train whenever you have to be there. So having a, having a, a, a touch with what's going in, in domain is very important. It's critical, I would say, for every company interested, organization interested to keep track with the, the, the trend, the, the, uh, to survive and to, and to thrive for long term. When it comes to short term, so this is this is this is interesting. I have a I have this thinking that uh, uh, this is a challenge, you know, to measure to put a ROE on on your project on your on your uh, on your AI development. So many times I look to do AI as a um, automation problem because in fact what you do, you know, you do whatever. Uh, a brain does you build the artificial intelligence and you do and you do the same thing with whatever a human being can do in quotes you can do that but like theoretically speaking you no know, you do so so i see this i see this and many times an ai machine learning even like as, a, as an automation problem so if you start from here you can probably much easier build a use case you know how much time you save how many how many resources you 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 uh, you uh, help to move to a different, uh, more, more intelligent, more elaborated uh, task. So, uh, so uh, this is what I will try to build uh, the ROE around projects many times, and it's, it's successful. Uh, it's successful, I, I see. So this is more or less the way I see this. Uh, the, the, I complete my colleague's answer. So it's, but yeah. I, 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 I see this a challenge. You know, it's a challenge because many times you cannot foresee whatever the benefits you bring it, you, you need creativity here and being on the same line with business and the, on the efficiency side is great. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's often an easy way to, uh, to quantify it is in time savings and efficiency gains. Uh, that, you know, that speaks immediately. Of course, you are capped at a, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the gain is capped at a full improvement, a 100% gain. Uh, and so I think we do need to think about ways to, uh, to capture the, you know, the new value of what uh, uh, of what AI can can create. Um, but it's always hard then to, you know, to, to assess what is the incremental value from the AI specifically versus what uh, what would have been accomplished otherwise. Um, before moving on to our next question, I would just like to remind the audience to please go ahead and submit any questions that you may have uh, using the Q&A function here in the, uh, in the Zoom interface. Um, you can go ahead and drop those in and we'll get to those after our, uh, our next question. Um, so our previous question was about value and why do we do this from, uh, from a business perspective, which is of course an extremely important uh, question. Um, but I would, uh, I would argue that this third question is even more important, uh, which is how do we ensure that when we're going Going out and realizing all this you know, wonderful business value from uh, from AI that we all hope to realize, how do we ensure that we're managing the risks um, and that we're not inadvertently creating harm? Um, you know, this can uh, gets into questions of you know the the ethics of uh, of doing AI, um, ensuring that there is appropriate transparency into the the modeling process, the the decision making uh, that goes into that. Um, and so, I'd like to start with Tudor. Uh, going back to you, um, how do you think about that ethical dimension to you know this uh, this very important work? That we're, that we're all working on. No, this is, this is critical. It's very, very important considering the nature of the, the problems AI solves and the, 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 the way the solution comes, you know, many times like a black, black or a gray box. So I would I'd say three components I see here, but the, the discussion is, is big. So I can, can, go, can go for many, many hours. 
I said governance, data, and models. So governance around the process. So this, this is very, very critical to have, a, first of all, to have a framework, uh, a trustworthy, we in BIMO, we have a trustworthy AI framework where we, where we, we follow in all the processes when, when it comes to AI. So having a framework and having a governance around the process to ensure that the process is repetitive and repetitively follow the, the prescriptions uh, uh, agreed around by, by the framework, it's crucial. Now, many things we can talk about this stuff, but I just wanted to put on the table. The second one is the data. And this is a little mixture of, of, of governance and, uh, and state of the art. You want to be sure that the data is not uh, is not biased. You want to be sure the statistical um, uh, the statistical representation of data is uh, in, on your lab and 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 and, and the development is the same with the one you you have in production. And uh, it's about uh, to continue checking, you know, and confirming that the time passes, the data you process is the same. You don't need to rebuild and to retrain the model. And the last one is the model itself. You know, it's. Um, it's they say they say the entire the entire industry the entire uh, uh, image processing industry is biased by the images you find on the net because in fact you depend on the data so the models even if you say you put aside testing or training you 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 you, uh, you re uh, rebuild the models to to fit with the data you you have so it's important the model to be and uh, a suggestion i found a couple of years ago and i find it very very interesting is to be sure that the, your model is reviewed by people from different views from different angles it's important to even a non ai specialist to to look on the on the on the results somebody from business somebody from you know like a, like an artistic background if you are a technical company and so on it's very important and i think this makes sense you know so again summarizing my answer is uh, uh, governance around the process data and and, and models I think that's very clear and very, uh, you know, very, very complete as well. Uh, like you said, we can easily go for hours uh, on the topic because there are so many dimensions. Um, Adele, how do you see those different uh, dimensions feeding into, um, yeah, these broad questions around uh, is what we're doing the right way to be doing it and the right thing to be doing? Yeah, and I think Tudor did, a, uh, did an excellent job at sort of framing up the kind of a template to sort of follow the other thing I would add in there, you know, as leaders in this space and, and, and the view that I take and, and the way we sort of manage on this is uh, that leadership role as that champion. I mean, we, we're there to protect, we're there to manage the risk and to, to build the trust. And obviously we're driving to in understanding the impacts of potentially some of the decisions or what's going on and how that impacts individuals. And really, um, you know, our, our sort of North Star on this is to take a look at um, ensuring that the data that we're collecting, we're using it in the way that it was intended and, and the permission that we have. And that's where the governance is, uh, is a really a key piece here in terms of ensuring that you have some type of way to provide that oversight on this. And, and really, it can, it can actually help create the guardrails and, and help really move um, projects or things that you're doing, but it's very much, um, you know, something that is at the at the core of all of us. I mean, I think we all have a role to play in here, particularly from a leadership role and ensuring that the right things are done and that we're ultimately understanding the impacts and, and protecting people and the data. Extremely well said. Um, Bala, to close us out on this topic, uh, your perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, Tudor gave us an excellent framework and uh, Adele added the most important component of leadership. Um, so I don't have anything specific to add. I will probably just reinforce this with um, an example that, you know, in the end, it, it needs to have good governance and then good people around it. And um, one of the ways it can, it can be reinforced is there should be a culture all across whether is the AI explainable? Uh, are we asking the right questions at the AI, right from was the data biased to do we really understand the output of the model and can we explain it and we are all comfortable with it? That is a process that needs to be in place, you know, with people and automation and everything uh, for, for rooting out these things. Um, otherwise, you know, if a company just accepts black box results, 
just because they, they deliver value and they provide that output, then uh, this problem is not going to go away. Even in simple case, like uh, we do weather correlation, we do work for retailers where we correlate weather with product sales and, and tell them here are the, what the model finds, you know, based on this, is, this product is truly in this location, is truly associated, has a weather uh, correlation. Uh, the way we have set it up is sort of a, a pyramid type analysis. One is basic statistical analysis that you know has no AI that just explains you know it runs through basic statistics to see there are correlations. Then at the step two, we run non deep learning models, models that can be explained, models that have attributes that can be easily understood, and only after these two steps, if it's fairly clear and that there is value, then we normally this use for demand forecasting, then we go into a deep learning level to, to look at, can we apply deep learning here and, and move the needle. So I think that, you know, even, in, even though in this use case, it's not affecting anybody, having such a, a process and all the principles that uh, Tudor and Adele talked about into the people is what's going to make, the, you know, the biases and all of these things caught early. Very good. Thank you so much, Val. And I think that it's uh, it's actually a really good uh, transition for uh, what will be our last question that we're going to cover today in the seven minutes remaining that we have in this. Um, I want to ask about the uh, uh, about the people dimension and specifically uh, finding the people that you need to work on these topics uh, within your organizations. You know, I think well, generally there's a talent shortage uh, uh, across the economy. Uh, it's particularly acute in data and engineering roles, and then even more so in the AI or machine learning roles. Um, so perhaps starting with uh, Adele and then uh, Bala and then Tudor, um, how are you addressing this uh, within your organization? How are you uh, how are you getting past this? And if I may, uh, you know, are you are you thinking creatively about you know who do you need doing which roles? How many experts do you need for um, let's call them lay people who they, who can then come into the uh, the fold and be upskilled? Um, Adele, would you like to uh, uh, to take a stab at that? Sure, I think. To say there's a data, there's a shortage of labor, a skilled labor in this space, right from, um, you know, Bala spoke about the piping and that data engineering, right to sort of the governance roles in terms of the data governance piece to provide that framework, and then on the data science side of it. So, um, it, so you know, how do you get creative? Well, one is you take a look at internally, right? Are there uh, people within the organization that have uh, desires to kind of move into this space. Obviously, you look to potentially the universities or colleges to kind of uh, recruit. The other side that we started to take a look at it um, is, you know, do we leverage our third parties? Are there vendors out there um, that can provide us with the basically the staff augmentation, another way to sort of look at it from our perspective. So we have actually started to get very creative with some really good partners that we have to sort of figure out how we can move the agenda forward and um, deal with the staff, um, that talent shortage. And mm -hmm. for our industry, like for example, commercial real estate, um, we're not known to be sort of leading edge or bleeding edge on this stuff. So it even it's doubly difficult for us to attract because we're competing against like the Bank of Montreal's and the other banks. And, and it's, it's really tough to get that talent. So that's why it, being creative becomes even more so important to us. Excellent. Uh, Bala, what has been the approach uh, at, uh, at Belmarix? Very similar. I think the, the slight nuances are with regarding to university partnerships, we have been trying to more, instead of just recruiting from the university uh, fresh people, we have been trying to go upstream and have uh, a research grant or a research project initiated with the university um, where we get in the students and faculty and throw to them an interesting problem. And this leads to a excitement in them when they finish the project, hey, this is a career I actually want to continue and therefore they are more ready for us. And it also gives us lots of learning just to, through that process. You know, is this a problem that we can solve through, through AI? Um, other than that, as Adele said, you know, there's lots of talent typically in companies, whether it's, uh, you know, in our companies there are app developers, software engineers, infrastructure people, many of them are constantly looking at, you know, where to go in their career. 
And often, you know, uh, getting into a data science or a data engineering career is a, is a big jump. So to us, it's a retention when people want to, uh, philosophy, when people want to say, hey, I, I'm looking at this career, can we take their existing skills and you know, give them the resources to retrain in this area and then contribute back. This way, you know, we are keeping them happy and they're also providing value to us. And then the third part, you know, always looking for external partners where, you know, uh, who add clear value. I think that's the more, most important thing that if there is clear value that they can add and engaging that external partner is, is hugely beneficial. Thank you, Balit. Uh, Kuder, in the you know, roughly 90 seconds we have left. Oh. I can. Uh, You're going quick. <laughs> well, so everything said here, it's 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 very it's, it's true. It's true. We are doing the same stuff. I'm doing the same stuff. I did it for four years. No collaborations, university, and so on. Something else I want to add. It's about because the the um, this skill set is like a very precious commodity. We have to treat it as such. So uh, I'm talking about roles or jobs granularity. You know, think about uh, you have a. 20 people team, if you want to have a strong AI, you need 20 PhDs or 20 masters. No, you, you can't do this, stuff, but you can do something else. You can say, you can put aside two people like a data scientist, you know, or, or AI uh, researchers. You can have machine learning engineers. So this guy, they don't all want to be uh, data scientists in that field. They, they just have to, have to be able to get the models once they are built, to put them in a nice, in a, in a strong, in a powerful application. You need data engineers. They, those guys in a different set of, of, of skill sets. So this is why you can probably split the team in micro, micro teams, micro groups, to cover a big array of, of skills and to somehow maybe help you, uh, you know, concentrate the, the, the precious commodity in, in, in small spots. So I, I tried to be 90 seconds. I'm not sure if I've been able to. But I know I, you, I, you did. Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was fantastic. And I think we were even a little bit under, I would put in about 75 seconds. Um, but no, I, I hope I didn't put uh, any undue pressure on you, Tudor, uh, because I think that that, uh, you know, that uh, broadly collaborative stitching together of different skill sets, that's, uh, uh, I think, an approach that we've uh, seen a lot of success with it, as well across industries. Um, but with that, uh, that brings us just about to, uh, to the time uh, for, uh, uh, for this panel session. Um, once again, thank you, Tudor, Bala, and Adele for, uh, for your wonderful insights. Um, this has, I think, been a very interesting conversation. And of course, thanks to James for the, uh, uh, the great organization. Uh, James, let me, let me hand it back over to you. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you, Kurt, for, for fantastic uh, moderation of that session. I, I thought it was a really great conversation. And just to echo Kurt as well, thank you, uh, Bala and Adele and Tudor for sharing your experiences. And um, I thought it was really valuable. So thank you all for, for taking part. And of course, thank you to Data IQ for, for supporting the session and bringing us together as well. Um,